People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Care gives off a vibe. Knowledge does not. If I share with you data, it may be useful to you, but it's not going to give off a vibe. It won't resonate. If I share how much I care, empathy, that will resonate. You'll feel it. Welcome back to the Mulligan Brothers, and today's interview is about escaping the matrix with none other than Rabbi Simon Jacobson, the author of the book Toward a Meaningful Life, a bestseller that takes 4,000 years of ancient philosophies, teachings, and spirituality and guides people to have a great life, escape the matrix and the rat race that we are currently in. Today's video was made possible at mulliganbrothers.com where there is now the Black Friday sale. Buy one, get one free. Use code BLACK on the website right now at www.mulliganbrothers.com for buy one, get one free across the whole range, mix and match. Get the cheapest item for free. Thank you for supporting us as always. And before that, how do we escape the matrix with Rabbi Simon Jacobson? Let's jump into the video. For those who don't know, just introduce yourself. I know you've been on the channel before, but if you could just do, introduce yourself and uh, a brief of just what you do. Simon Jacobson is my name. Some people refer to me as Rabbi Simon Jacobson. But I have questions about that word, Rabbi, <laughs> because I don't like labels and stereotypes. But I am technically a rabbi in the sense of uh, not a community rabbi or a pulpit rabbi, but more of a scholar, writer, teacher, mentor, counselor to many. And I head the Meaningful Life Center, MeaningfulLife.com, which produces a wide array of videos, articles, podcasts, you name it, that tries to um, take the universal spiritual teachings and turn them into a contemporary blueprint, a contemporary blueprint for life, addressing everything from relationships to pain to birth to education to marriage, sexuality. And uh, I've been trained in both disciplines, meaning I grew up in a uh, Jewish, intense Jewish community but with a focus of not a parochial Jewish approach, but one that's universal for people of all backgrounds and all faiths or no faiths, as essentially what I like to call a spiritual, a psycho-spiritual map of life that uh, maps out or like an x-ray of your soul. So then you can align yourself and help improve, just like the body needs nourishment and vitamins and minerals, so too does the soul. And that's what I do. Life skills, I have a great team at the Meaningful Life Center. And uh, I've been doing this for almost 40 years, over 40 years. I wrote a book called Toward a Meaningful Life. I've written some other books as well, Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer, Spiritual Guide to the High Holiday, 60 Days. But many, many hundreds of articles, and I'm out there. Um, lately, you had a YouTube uh, skyrocketing, and, uh, and here I am with you talking about life. We're going to talk a little bit of the book, um, and I just I just wanted to get a sort of um, overview of the book. So I think when people hear rabbi, they think uh, it's going to be teachings from Judaism, and it's that they're where the teacher is going to come from. But you pick from loads of different places. You don't just speak about religion; you speak about many different subjects. Just a brief overview of what is the contents of the book. So toward a meaningful life. I wrote in the year 1995. It's since been published many times and published uh, by William Morrow, a major publisher in the United States. It's been translated into 14 languages that uh, testifies to its popularity. Um, I would say the following. For me, religion was never religion. To me, religion always sounded like a, uh, almost like a like pigeonholing that's like for religious people. Um, and I always thought of it this way, you know, if you're a human being and then you're a religious human being, what does that suggest? That you're not human, you know? So I would rather, instead of the word religion, I would use the word spiritual, meaning a deeper way of looking at your life, that we're not just materialistic human beings, or as some say, we're not just uh, uh, physical human beings on a spiritual journey, we're spiritual beings on a physical journey. And this book distills Yes, teachings of the Bible, of the Torah, of Jewish thought, of literally an unbroken chain of thousands of years, but it's the universal dimension. 
You know, in religion itself, there's concepts, rituals, like the Sabbath, eating kosher, uh, Yom Kippur. I mean, they're holidays, just as there are in Christianity and in Islam. But then there's the universal values, things like charity, virtue, dealing with uh, pain, marriage, relationships. If you think about it, every human being on earth is dealing with that. So this does not focus on the parochial side of and the ritualistic and parochial side of Judaism, it focuses on the universal teachings. Remember, at the end of the day, Christianity and Islam are both originate from the Bible, and they associate with that. So on that level, it's really for everyone. I would go a step further. It's not just for religious people. This book was written for all people. It's essentially how you connect to your soul and how you create deeper meaning in every aspect of your life. I actually asked people off the street, men, women, of all faiths and no faith, of all colors, creeds, races, I said, what are the 30 most important topics in your life? And they all answered the same. It's just at different times in life, we focus on different things, but everyone said the same things, no matter who they were, religious or not religious, Jewish or not Jewish, things like, and I wrote a chapter in each one of them, starting with body and soul, birth, childhood, education, um, uh, marriage, love, intimacy, charity and wealth. I'm just going through all the chapters. Health and fitness, um, pain and suffering, fear and anxiety. And then I dealt with social matters like responsibility, government, science, technology. And then theological issues, God, unity, good and evil, miracles, redemption. And I wrote a chapter for each uh, one of these topics. And this is the book that came out and very popular. And Meaningful Life Center is an outgrowth of the success of this book. There's so much in this book that we could cover. I think one of the things that comes up constantly with questions of our audience, especially on Instagram, asking us how to deal with anxiety, um, the uh, fear as well. And, you know, I would love to go through that. Chapter 16 is fear and anxiety, the enemies within. I'd love to hear some more on it. So fear and anxiety are one of those enemies that are invisible because they're not loud and they don't have weapons. But the effect every one of us knows, the effect of fear. Fear causes us to retreat. It weakens us. It paralyzes us. The inability to make a decision, a commitment. You know, fears can be fears, real fears. It can be imagined fears. And especially in the area of the emotional Fear really plays an important role. Just to use a, a, maybe the most textbook classic example. If your parents did not have a good marriage or they were fighting or there was divorce and there was a lot of acrimony, a lot of anger, you're going to be afraid to go into a relationship because you don't want something like that. How many people have told me, I don't want to get married because I, my parents had a very bad marriage. Um, some people don't want to have children because they were hurt as children. These are all fears driven by very legitimate reasons. The reason essentially is that I was hurt. It would be like you know someone who was uh, bitten by a dog as a child. Every time they see a dog, they're going to be afraid. Like any trauma, we're afraid of these traumas because these traumas repeat themselves in our lives. So the, the challenge with fear and anxiety is, like I said, if someone came to you with a gun to your head, okay, that's an enemy. But fear doesn't come with a gun to your head. It just weakens you. And many people are even afraid to say they're afraid. So they make believe they're all tough and all that. Then the day, just a, a, a fearful child that is afraid to get into relationships. You know, today we have big issue, commitment issues. You date someone, everything seems to be working. Then one of the partner, one of the people dating suddenly starts retreating, is afraid to move on. And they don't, they deny it. They say, no, I'm not afraid. I'm, a, you know, but they... The fact of the matter is because when you're emotionally vulnerable, you're exposed. And if you've been hurt, you don't want to be hurt again. You know, If your heart was broken by someone, you don't want it to be broken again. That's why it's so complicated to deal with fear because many of us are not even aware of our own fears. But I would say fear and insecurity is one of the most powerful driving forces in life that causes us to make either bad decisions or no decisions and causes us to really stagnate and not really move forward because 
you know, better not take any risk. I knew someone that I used to always tell him, you're a great guy, you're such a, you'll, you'll be such a good husband, you'll be such a good father. No, nah, I don't want to take the risk. So I said to him, the greatest risk is taking no risk. Recently, he got married. He got married in Costa Rica. I was there. And he told me at the wedding, he said to me, i would never forget what you told me. The greatest risk is taking no risk. And I realized, correct. And I decided to take a risk. And he's the happiest person today. So I think fear is one of those forces that, for, that, that needs to be acknowledged. But at the same time, you don't fight fear with, again, with weapons. You fight fear with courage. You fight fear with things you believe in. So when I meet people who tell me that they're fearful or, they're, or I see they're experiencing it, I try to find what, what are you not fearful about? Let's find something that you're comfortable with and let's start building upon that, some value system, some belief system, something that you consider to be very strong in your life. There's a, uh, a story, I think I tell it in this chapter, on fear and anxiety. He was, a, uh, he, was a, he was the teacher and father-in-law of my mentor, the Rebbe. He was called the previous Rebbe. So he was arrested in 1927 in the former Soviet Union by the Bolsheviks who did everything possible to abolish religion and faith. And he, they saw him as a threat, what they called a counter-revolutionary. Because it undermined the loyalty to the, I guess, to the Soviet regime. He was a man that was known for his, his, um, his indomitable spirit. You could not break him. And he writes in his diary, which he actually calls Tractate from Hell, because they tortured him. It was, it was very tough. And he said one of the captors pointed a gun to his head and said, Rabbi, Rabbi, um, mind you, he said in Yiddish, because he was a Jew, but he was a secular one. And he said, this gun has changed many people's minds. It's caused many people to cooperate. And the rabbi responded. His name was Rabbi Joseph Isaac Schneerson. That was his name. It's in 1927. It's in Stalinist Russia, Stalinist Soviet Union. And the rabbi said to him calmly, he said, this toy, he referred to the pistol, to the gun as a toy, he said, this toy can frighten someone who has one world and many gods, but not someone who has one god and many worlds. You know, we call it investments, they call it diversification. If you put all your eggs in one basket, so if someone takes away that basket, you're lost. But if you have many baskets and you've diversified, you, not, I, you know, the, the rabbi wanted to live, but don't think you can frighten me because you're going to kill me, because something else will live on. My spirit will live on. I have my students, I have my legacy. Where someone who has only one world and many gods, once you take that world from them, that materialistic world, it's all over. In other words, the counterforce to fear is faith, is some type of connection to something that the fear does not affect. And that allows you the power to rise above the, the concerns and fears. Because fear can be very debilitating. And that's essentially the theme of the chapters, how you connect to your... Um, deeper eternal wellsprings of your soul that allows you to take, forge ahead even when there's doubts and unknown uncertainties that can cause you to be fearful. It's essentially connecting to something higher that doesn't let you fall below, so your fears somewhat dissipate. And you'll see it again, all the people of courage that you will see, they all had something that was stronger that kept them going. They believed in it. I mean, let's be honest, which soldier which military person wants to go fight? But if you're fighting for a cause that you think is important, you'll, you'll do that. Because the cause gives you the strength to overcome your fears. And, and frankly, I mean, I'll just use the other extreme, even simple coaching, a tennis coach, a sports coach, when a, uh, a top athlete gets into a funk, psychologically feels an injury, or someone got to their head, what do you need? You need someone to give you that the impetus and the energy to get over your own fears, fear of failure, fear, fear of loss. So it's always finding a deeper strength that counters the fears in our lives. The biggest risk is taking no risk at all. I've heard, because you know, I've heard, I've heard it before, but um, I'd love to hear a little bit more on it because I know our audience will really connect with that message. So the bigger, biggest risk is taking no risk at all. You know, people think I'm gonna stay on the fence and that way I play safe. Yeah, but you could also end up 
never accomplish anything in life. So that's why it's the biggest risk. You end up not go going anywhere. So of course, if you start using your mind, there are many reasons not to do things. And if you get stuck in your head, you could end up doing your whole life and never really fulfilling what you need to fulfill. One of the saddest poems out there is from Oliver Wendell Holmes. He wrote a poem called The Voiceless, where he writes, look, think of this, this uh, tra tragic line. Alas, alas to those that die with their song still inside them. In other words, we all have a song inside us. And many of us are afraid to let sing, either because our parents or our educators or society has pressured us to fit into their mold instead of our own. So you can live your whole life and never sing your song. That's the greatest risk of all. You've never been who you should have been. You never actualized your potential. So yes, is life filled with risk? There's no such thing as success without the possibility for failure. When your child begins to walk, that child will fall. Any parent that says, I don't want my child to fall, I'm not going to let that child walk, or I'll hold the child when they start walking, will never allow their child to walk. You have to let them walk. You're there for them. You say, I'm here to pick you up. I'm here to support you. But every, every walk has to begin with falling at least once or twice or three times. I remember reading once this, I think, a tremendous analogy. Beautiful. So we all know a caterpillar metamorphosizes into a butterfly. It's one of those fascinating things. A caterpillar that crawls on the ground or on a leaf suddenly goes into a cocoon after a little while. It goes through that whole metamorphosis, that process. From the chrysalis emerges a butterfly. So besides the fact that it's a lesson in life, how we can grow, but it doesn't come easily. Once the cocoon begins to open up, you can see the new butterfly is struggling to get out. So someone was watching the butterfly struggle, and he was in compassion. He decided, you know what? Why should he struggle, the butterfly? He took a pair of scissors, a knife, and he cut open the cocoon to let the butterfly out because he saw it struggling. And to his chagrin, sadly, he's watching the butterfly on the branch, and the butterfly does not take flight. And then he comes to realize that he actually destroyed the butterfly's life. Because the pressure, when you struggle to get out of the cocoon, drives liquid into the wings of the butterfly that creates the aerodynamics necessary for it to fly. Because he thought he's depriving the butterfly from the struggle, the butterfly can never fly. Can, there was, that liquid never went into its wings, and it just remained. So in other words, sometimes the challenges of life that we think we're struggling through are actually the things that give us the strength to fly. So the greatest risk is not taking no risk at all by saying, you know what, I, I want to be comfortable. I'm not going to, I don't need extra pressure. Pressure in life is critical. You don't want undue pressure. You don't want a pressure that's overwhelming. But there's nothing in life that doesn't work with that pressure. You know, as a writer, I can tell you, if I didn't have deadlines and pressures, I probably, this book would never have been published. I'd still be sitting and, and ruminating uh, what, you know, different options. You need to have deadlines and pressure. We hate it but it's what makes us grow. There's an expression that olive does not produce oil until you squeeze it, until you pressure it, you crush it. The idea of staying on the fence and sitting on a fence and not doing something, I think we see a lot of wait, waiting for the perfect time. And I think, you know, the, there's something to be said for waiting for a, the right time possibly, but a lot of people are waiting for the perfect time, especially when starting businesses. Um, you know, it's not economically safe right now. It's not this, it's not that. And I think a lot of the time they are procrastinating or they're stuck almost in the fear of, of beginning, but they've got some form of excuse or something. Um, you know, what would your what would your advice be to somebody who wants to get started, who wants to get going in something, whether it be a business or athletically or a relationship or something, but they're waiting for the right environment to do it. So what would be advice to someone who is starting a business or starting a new initiative or a new relationship to make sure they don't get paralyzed by staying on the fence and waiting for the perfect time? How do you put the balance between knowing when to move and when to wait? It's a great question. It's obviously case by case, but I will give a few guidelines. It's critical 
to always bring in someone that's been there, someone with experience, because that helps build confidence. I mean, you see this in every area of life. You see it in sports, you see it in the military, you see it in business. It's called mentoring. You work with a veteran who's been there and they help you because a lot of times it's lack of confidence is due to lack of experience. So you speak, so it's good to have a mentor, whether it's a business mentor or a, or a relationship coach that can help you say, you know what, this resistance you're having is healthy. It's good to, or no, this resistance is just fear and inexperience and it's time to take a leap. So I think one simple piece of advice that people don't usually follow is find someone you can talk to that's more objective than you. Because our subjectivity blinds us, sometimes causes too many fears or sometimes causes us to be reckless and move too quickly. Sometimes you need someone to tell you, you know what, this needs more due diligence, a little more time, do a little more research. Or sometimes, no, you're waiting too long and it's time to make a move. So having someone you can run it by is a vital, vital piece. Um, it's also acknowledging that you don't have it all figured out. And you can't always know. That's part of what risk is about. You know, you can't always know. Is the time right or not? Also, to get rid of the concept of perfection. There is no such thing as perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect time. That's just an illusion. It's usually an excuse to procrastinate. You know, perfect time. What does perfect time mean? What is it? I think the French say that the enemy of uh, good is not bad. It's perfect. You know, because was, I'm not going to do it until it's perfect. So then you're never going to do what's good either. So knowing it's like today, I think in technology, they know everything in business and technology is today beta. Google introduced that. Everything, you're testing everything and you're constantly modifying. You don't say I'm going to launch once it's perfect. There's no such thing as a perfect website. There's no such thing as a perfect technology. Because until people don't test it, you don't know their reaction. So you're always going to have to do something to say, so you can say, I'm testing it. It's a, a beta launch. Let's test it. Then we'll improve it. And you could always be in that mode. So anyone that's successful knows that. They do not wait for perfection. It's an illusion. It's immature, actually. You do everything you can, get objective advice, and then take the leap. And then learn from it. And you know what? If a mistake was made, you learn from the mistake. And you'll become better next time. The second part of this is the anxiety part. I mean, what is the, uh, what is anxiety and how can people deal with it and uh, yeah, move, move past it? So what is anxiety and how do you deal with it and how do you pass, how, you, how do you grow through it? Um, I want to distinguish between clinical anxiety and we'll call it more day-to-day -day anxiety. You know, clinical anxiety, there are people who have that anxiety or depression even, and they may need a professional like a psychiatrist or a slash therapist who will maybe prescribe a medication. I'm not pushing medication necessarily, but you know, there are medications today that don't solve the problem, but they lower the temperature so the anxiety is not as intense. And we all know anxiety is, creates more anxiety. Anxiety doesn't let you make good decisions. You become impulsive, reckless even. So sometimes you may need that and, and you also would need to talk to someone so I don't want to talk about that because if you need a professional, you should go to a professional. It's not going to be my few words here. But I want to talk about the anxiety that we have more control over. Not that that's not a chemical imbalance or something chemical or clinical. Um, so I think a good way to put it is this. There's a healthy anxiety even. We'll call it angst, healthy angst. I know the word anxiety sounds terrible, but let me explain. I remember was a guy, he was a cardiologist, a heart doctor came to one of my classes and he was a really sweet guy, but he had a very difficult life, personal and health. He had a lot of issues, challenges. And I always really felt for him. One day he comes to me, he says to me, I'm such a terrible week I've had. Maybe you can do something, intervene. And just, I'd like to have a peaceful week, just total peace. And he had a good sense of humor. So I said to him, so you mean like a flat line? So he said, no, no, not that peaceful. You know, a flat line in a cardiogram is a sign of death. You don't want a flat line. A heartbeat, a healthy heartbeat looks like a wave, like that, like a wave. You know, there's the contraction, expansion of the heart, like the breath, exhale, inhale. So a flat line means the heart has stopped. 
So it means he's basically saying, and this is the point I want to make, that healthy life is restlessness. That's a healthy life. There's going to be ups and downs. Every heart that beats is contracting and expanding all the time. The journey of life is up and down. When it goes to extremes, if you have an extreme up, it peaks too high or goes down too low, that's when you get into either high levels of, of anxiety and or high levels of depression or resolution. Like, you know, people are so calm and relaxed and they're never restless, that's also not healthy. They're just sitting, they're not motivated. So you want to always have a certain healthy measure of restlessness and angst, but not one that's so extreme that takes control of your life. So I think it's important to understand that we all need a certain element of longing, seeking, reaching, yearning. If you don't have that, you're not human. And I actually cite a verse in the book of Proverbs. It says, the soul of a human being is a divine flame. It's a flame of God. Look at a flame. A flame never rests. It's always flickering. It's always restless. That's what a soul is like, a restlessness. The body could be very, um, the body can become extremely lethargic and almost like dead. You know, you're just sitting around. But the flame is always that spirit. And when you see somebody who stopped flickering, it's not a good sign. If they, if they lack the sparkle in the eye, whatever reason, there's something missing. Okay, so it's important to know that the soul is a flickering flame, always restless. And longing is necessary. And longing is always going to create, I don't have it yet. So that's going to create some form of angst. I don't want to call it anxiety. When it goes, spills over to the point that it's so much anxiety, so much tension, and you don't have resolution, that's the problem. So there's actually a mystical concept called tension and resolution. You always need that measure. Tension means you're longing for something, you're seeking something, and then you find it and integrate it. And then you continue climbing. So it's always important to look up and then try to gain and internalize it and then continue climbing. I'll just share a story. There was a story with one of, I bring that in the book, Toward a Meaningful Life, in the chapter on body and soul, that there were children playing on a ladder. And all the children were afraid to climb to the top, except one child. He climbed all the way to the top. So his grandfather, who was watching, said to his grandson, and said, tell me, why were you the only one that was had the courage to climb to the top of the ladder? And his answer was brilliant. He said, because when the other children were climbing, they kept looking down. So they saw how high they were. They were afraid to climb higher. When I was climbing, I kept looking up. I saw how low I was, so it motivated me to climb higher. So a healthy, growing human being is always looking up. And when you look up, you always see horizons you haven't conquered yet. So it's a motivator. But there's also going to be a measure of tension, a measure of angst. And that's healthy. So don't confuse. Don't think just because you have some anxiety, maybe it can be turned into something that you want something. Translate it, what do you want? And now figure out how to get it. Now, when anxiety goes overboard, then you need the other side. You need something to resolve. You need something where you can find peace and calm and say, okay, what is it that I'm anxious about? And let's see if I can resolve it. And again, I'm distinguishing distinguishing this from clinical or chemical anxiety or depression. I saw that you'd had a conversation. It was a video that you did, a conversation with Sri Lanka monks, and you put uh, the fascinating conversation you had. What were the kind of things that you learned from from speaking to them. So let me tell you the whole story, okay? It was a few years ago, and I remember it was between the Jewish holidays, Yom Hashanah, Yom Kippur. So these are like considered the days of awe, the holy days. And they had come here to New York, and actually they were coming to visit a museum in my neighborhood. So the, the, the director of the museum asked me to share a few words for them. So it was around... 25, 30 Sri Lankan monks. They were dressed in orange robes. And uh, and I spoke for them. I, I, I chose to speak about something that I thought, they're coming from the Buddhist tradition, something in common with Jewish mysticism, the idea of energy, that everything in existence is really energy that's vibrating, energy that's, that, is, that is vivifying and feeding the physical world. And I spoke. As a speaker, you always like to feed off your audience. So you look at them, and they, no reaction. They didn't laugh at my jokes. They didn't cry at my sad stories. I saw no reaction. 
And it was really disconcerting because usually audiences, especially in American audiences, including Jewish audiences, they're always reacting. They're telling you if they like it or they don't like it. You know, they'll make, oh, I heard that one, you know, or you're constantly hearing a feeling. Here they were completely silent. Now, I know that their tradition is to listen when the master speaks to be quiet. But still, I wanted to get some reaction. So then I decided, you know what, let me sing a song. I asked them permission, and I sang a Hasidic melody, a very a very uh, moving and touching song. And here their faces changed. It like melted. So afterwards, I asked them, I said, did you hear my words? They said, yeah, we loved what you said. So I said, no reaction. They said, we're trained when the teacher speaks, the master speaks, you don't react, you're just absorbing. You're in absorption mode. I said, what happened by the song? They said, we couldn't control ourselves. So that was the main interaction. And it was really unbelievable because I realized that song has its own language. So I, I, I can't say I learned much from them because I was, the, I was the speaker, they were the listeners, but I did learn from them because I saw that they, they can teach us how to absorb well. You know, many of us are processing while we should be absorbing. We right away have an opinion even before the other person has, hasn't finished the sentence. They're already giving your opinion. So that was a tremendous thing. And, uh, but I also saw the power of song that transcends everything. So when all else fails, it's a very good uh, tool to use. You can always reach someone with a song. If you're enjoying this interview with Rabbi Simon Jacobson, please consider supporting us at mulliganbrothers.com. Remember, today's video is sponsored by the Black Friday sale. Use code BLACK for buy one, get one free across the whole range at mulliganbrothers.com up until this Friday. Once it is gone, it is gone. The link is in the description. But before that, let's dive into the video. This is one that does well on our channel. I don't know if you've mentioned it before, but it's the, the idea that we are living in a matrix, that we are brainwashed into being a certain way, programmed to being in a certain way. And one of the, to the talking points that I've asked a few different people who, who have um, open minds to this kind of concept is how do we escape that matrix? How do we escape that, that brainwashing or that sort of system that we're in? Okay, so the big question, of course, is the, the matrix. Are we living in a matrix that has programmed us and how do we escape that, if indeed that's the truth? I mean, when The Matrix, the film came out, and other science fiction films like that, it may have been fantasy, but we see now this is a real discussion going on with AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, chat GPT, and new technologies that people are seeing are not just replicating and doing our manual labor, you know, like crunching numbers in a calculator, but they're actually creative and they're poetic, and they can write an essay, and they can write a poem, they can write a song, they can write programming. Now I'm re reading that they are, medical institutions are using them to answer medical questions, and some are much better than the doctors. <laughs> so the big question out there, will machines replace humans? Will AI ultimately obliterate the human race because it'll replace us, it'll do better than we can? You know, there was a time, if you remember chess, the chess masters of the world could still beat a computer. Now that's not the case. Computers will always beat the greatest chess masters because they've learned and they adapt and so on. So in the Matrix, you of course have the classic story where the machines decide <laughs> to go to war with the humans and it's a war. So there is that doomsday apocalyptic scenario of robots and machines becoming so smart. We create them, but then they become smarter than us and they say, you're imperfect and we're more perfect than you. So we may obliterate. Why should we have the imperfect version? I know the next step in evolution, humans to machines. And then there is another uh, vision for the future. And no, that we humans will rise and will open the machine revolution, AI and so on will actually enhance the human race. I'm a subscriber to the latter, but I think it's up to us. And my response would be very straightforward. If you see yourself as a machine, then a better machine is going to replace you. If you see yourself as a soul with something transcendent about you, something that's sublime, that can be quantified and in, a, in the mechanics of a machine, then machines will be our tools. So I think it's up to us. If, if, the, if you f see yourself simply as a machine, so there'll be better machines. And I think this is going to be a challenge. You know, there was a time where humans spent most of the time working 
toiling in the field just to get a bushel of, of, of grain or a loaf of bread. You know, we had to work in the fields. We didn't have the technology. So um, then once the Industrial Revolution came on board and then steam engines and other technologies helped replace the human exertion, we were left with a lot of time on our hands. You know, as technology has advanced today, we can do things with the press of a button that once would take hours. So the question is, what are we going to do with our free time? If you're going to use it for nonsense, playing games and emptiness, machines will beat you because they'll do better with that you can do. But if you use the time to explore, but only humans can explore, which we'll call it the spiritual vistas, the potential of our destinies, that we humans can do, then machines will be our tools. It's really going to come down to that choice. So we can easily escape by recognizing, you know, everyone talks today about technology is so freeing us. Many people talk how it's addicting us. So people are addicted to their phones. I was sitting in a car with a, with a classmate of mine. We didn't see each other for years. We were being driven to our wedding. So I thought it's a good time to catch up. We're both sitting there, but he's busy texting. And I'm trying to get his attention. I'm elbowing him. I'm moving, you know. No, he's busy texting. So what do you think I did? I texted him. I'm sitting right near him. And he looks at his text and he says to me, I see he was like somewhat dis, uh, disconcerted. He said, uh, he said, are you texting me? I said, yeah. He says, you're sitting right near me. Why are you texting me? I said, because I can't get your attention. So he said, okay, you can wait online until I get to you. You know, that's what's happening. We're losing the human touch. And I, th I find it rude, frankly, we're sitting at a meeting just because everybody else is texting. The whole thing is like a type of uh, uh, group, group uh, rudeness. You know, everyone's, the idea of just sitting to talk to someone soul to soul, heart to heart, eye to eye, we're losing that uh, precious commodity, you know. Um, so as much as technology has emancipated us and is helping us, it can also enslave us if you allow it to. So you have to be an individual that says, this is just a machine, it's only a tool chest. Your hammer shouldn't control you, your screwdriver shouldn't control you, and your smartphone shouldn't control you. You should control it. But for that, we have to go back to the mission. You need to have a mission in life. And then you use the tools to fulfill that mission. If you don't have a mission, your smartphone and all the different browsing and all the chats and all the notices are gonna control your life. So it comes down to who's in control of your life, you, or the circumstances around you. You've done, you've done a video called Do This To Stand Out in a Crowd, but how, how do you stand out? Like, how, how, you know, we, we've said this, eight billion people, so it's a lot of people. Um, yeah, how, how do you stand out? Okay, so how do you stand out in a crowd and how do you uh, become a nonconformist? Because the tendency for all of us is to be conformist. That's how it is. We don't like to stand out. I mean, everyone likes to say I have a unique flair or a unique style, but not too much. You don't want to be a pariah. You don't want to be laughed at and mocked at. From our childhood, we've been trained, you conform. You have to do this to conform, to fit in. Um, so I, the tendency and the temptation to do that is understandable. It comes down to fear as well. Fear of being different, fear of being laughed at, fear of being dismissed. But at the same time, you don't want to lose your individuality. So it comes down to if that individual uh, unique you has been cultivated or not. You know, in a very healthy home, parents will obviously want their children to follow certain guidelines. You know, you don't cross the street by yourself. You don't do certain things. You don't stick your fingers into an electric outlet. I'm talking about a baby. But they also want to cultivate the individuality of the child. No two children are alike. But we live in a society, and I think, again, uh, through industrialization and technology, is only contributing to the conforming. You have to fit in a certain way. So to me, it goes back to the theme of who are you and what's, what are you like? You know, um, I ask people, who are you? They give me their business card. And I say, that's what you do. That's not who you are. And they say, what should I say? I've been doing it so long. What I do has become who I am. You hear that? What I do has become who I am. It should be the other way around. Who you are should define what you do. But often our jobs, our work, our responsibilities, 
expectations of others shape and define us. This is the work I do. I try to help people free themselves from those forces. You have something unique to contribute. You have your unique song. This doesn't mean you have to stand out in a way that, that uh, disrupts others, but how could you compromise yourself? So it's really helping people build the confidence in what they can do unique. As 8 billion people on this planet, yes, but not two are alike. You know, they say uh, when Mozart presented his composition of music, one of his masterpieces to the Archduke of Austria. So the, the, the Archduke thought he was a connoisseur of music. So he says to Mozart, beautiful, but far too many notes. You see, he's telling him far too many notes. Like, you know, it's like a, uh, someone coming into a building and telling the architect, too many rooms in this building. And Mozart purportedly responded, he says, yes, your majesty, but not one more than necessary. Every note is necessary. And I think it's important to realize that every human being, it doesn't matter how many people out there, that's, you have to know that you are unique and there's something you can contribute that only you can contribute. I think one of these storybooks they tell this guy walking on the beach and he sees all these uh, clams that have washed on the beach and he's throwing back in the water. He doesn't want them to dry up and die. So someone says to him, do you know how many clams there are there out there? You think it matters that you throw a few back into the water? He says, to this clam it matters. No, it's forget it, look at it, it's not a numbers game. This clam, I've saved its life. It's not, life is not quantifiable by numbers. It's not a numbers game. Any person you help, that person has been changed forever. It doesn't matter if there's another billion people or thousands of people. And we have to not lose sight of that. Look, the fact is we live in a world of numbers, in a world of crunching numbers, statistics, analytics, metrics, you know, and you can sometimes lose sight. I, I know this, uh, we do this work, you know, you start, okay, you have hundreds of thousands of subscribers, but there are, there are, there are hundreds of thousands of individuals. Each one is their own life. They're not just in a category. But marketing, you know, we need the demographic, we need the demographic, who are they, the target audience. So I understand the value of that, but don't let that become the way you define human beings. A human being is a unique soul. Everyone is individual. You know, everyone who has ever given birth to children knows your child is, that's your child. I remember once a journalist was in my grandmother's house. I was there, I was a kid, and my grandmother had nine children. My mother's the oldest of nine. So the journalist was a woman journalist, and she's writing an article. She was a real feminist. And she says to my grandmother, how do you have nine children? How do you divide your love? Nine parts. How could you manage that? So my grandmother, I remember, said to her, do you, you, you're not married, are you? You have no children. She said, right. I see from your question. You're asking, and you don't even know what it is. Let me explain to you. Love is not like a, a birthday cake. We can only divide it into so many parts. Love is infinite. And my grandmother gave a beautiful example. She said, love is like the sun, and it's reflected in every drop of water, just like in the Pacific Ocean. Every drop has the whole sun in it. My whole love goes to each child. And I remember that woman was visibly moved. So that's a love. It's not nine. It could be 90. It's not, the, it's not a numbers game. My full, the sun, the entire sun is reflected in every drop of water. So my full love is in every child in its own way. So that's something that needs to be, I guess, emphasized in our commoditized, fetishized world. <laughs> in this video, you speak about unle unleashing or uh, developing into a genius, your, your inner genius or your, your own genius. Um, yeah, let's dive into it. Okay, unleashing your inner genius, your inner creativity, your inner strengths. So... I think that let's do let's do a little lesson in uh, I get I'm going to call it um, a spiritual psychology for lack of a better way of phrasing it. You know we have our consciousness, which we're aware of. You know, simply put, the ideas that you are consciously aware of, your feelings that you're aware of. But we all know behind the curtain, or as they say, under the dashboard, there's more going on. You know, what psychology may call the subconscious. I like to call it the superconscious. An example being, if somebody has a rage problem, they get angry. And you see someone else doesn't get angry at the same, at the same events. 
So you know there must be something built up in their subconscious or superconscious. It may be something from their childhood. It may be a parent that used to get angry. So in other words, again, there's forces that beneath the surface that you don't always see. And this is also the positive side. How much potential lies in that superconscious state that we're not actualizing? I'll give another example. You know, let's say you can throw a stone 100 feet or 100 meters, whatever it is, you know. Um, we know with conditioning and exercise, you can develop the muscles to throw 200. Just like running a marathon, you can run one mile. After a while, you can run two or three or whatever the amount is. The same thing is with our potential. If you exercise your mind and your heart, you can also actualize more strength intellectually and spiritually and creativity. And everybody wants to know, how can I open up the creative juices to flow? So the Kabbalistic approach, which is a mystical approach, says there is a channel between consciousness and superconscious that you can widen. And the example I would give for it, you think of a faucet. Water is running from a reservoir the faucet regulates it, so it's only a small flow that goes into your cup from the sink. Imagine you could broaden the channel and you get more flowing through. That's the key to unleashing your potential. So how do you do that? There's two ways. Um, today, some people are doing it through psychedelics or through um, mind-altering experiences, but there's also natural ways to do it. One is through effort. When you work hard at something, exertion has the power to access deeper strengths. Like I mentioned before, with the conditioning, you work hard at something, you draw more. And the second, commitment and persistence. Meaning if you're really committed to something, you fight for it, it also has the power to break through and widen these channels. So when a person can join those two, exertion and commitment, you have yourself a way to access deeper strengths within you. But you, of course, you need to also have the, the courage, and, uh, but, but those two forces is what is the key. And everybody can unleash. I mean, I've done this in real workshops, help people get beyond their blocks. But we have blocks. We have all kinds of... Biggest one is our habits, our inertia. You get stuck in your habits, and then you just basically stagnate. You just stay in one place. You don't challenge yourself having someone like a, a competition helps as well because it pushes you like a dam you put a dam a resistance so then the water builds up and the pressure comes flowing through and you can get a lot more coming from your inner genius your inner potential you mentioned competition there what's the in, in judaism having like a competitiveness to you like is it is it accepted is it something that's taught like i mean what was your experience sort of growing up like how did you develop uh, and again towards ambition as well and uh, right. i guess it has that ego invested in it as well but like yeah what's your yeah so the question is what is um, the role of co competition how did i grow up in my tradition mm -hmm. in judaism it's a very good question because competition can go two directions i remember as a child i mean almost in all schools we play musical chairs you know they put up let's say 10 chairs and there's 11 kids they start playing music and the music stops whoever grabs a chair i always found it to be a very cruel game i never liked it because there was that one left out and then they move nine chairs and eight chairs so i found that to be a competition that was not that was demoralizing because the kid that didn't find the chair was too slow so i actually i was pretty fast so i used to actually play slow and i'd let the kid that was always the weak one to, to grab my seat, simply out of compassion. I didn't like it. I didn't like the, I didn't see how the competition is motivating anybody. It was just hurting some people. But then there's a concept of healthy competition where, let's say, a quiz or a test or a race. So what happens sometimes is your opponent, your, uh, the, uh, the other, is actually pushing you. Like I remember when uh, Djokovic became number one tennis player in the world, he said, how did he become? He kept losing to Federer and to Nadal. And his losses built up his strengths. Had he not lost to them, he would never have uh, built it up. So there is healthy competition, a certain healthy. Now, is there ego involved? There is some ego, but again, it's about balancing because there's something valuable in that. 
So I think you have to be very careful that competition should be not be demoralizing. If it demoralizes and doesn't really benefit anyone, what's the point? And you know, maybe people have fun. And then it's more like a, like a, like you know, people like blood. They like when more you know, like boxing or other sports that are very uh, that are very aggressive, very violent. People like blood. It's like the gladiators. They like someone blood being shed. I don't think that's healthy at all. But a competition that brings out your strengths by fighting the other, I don't say fighting, by having someone that challenges you, so it'll bring out deeper strengths. And if you don't have that that challenge, you may not be motivated enough to, to, to work for it. That would be the way. And that's what I learned how to balance the two. You've mentioned a couple of times vibrations, and I'd love to know how can people use vibrations or, or, the, or the concepts around vibrations to aid them in success or achieving things? Like, is, is there any sort of correlation and, and link between the two? So we're talking about vibrations, um, how people can access vibrations and access in, in their lives. I think it's important to begin with um, that we need to recognize vibrations. I think in this busy world, of turbulence and so much outer noise, we don't even hear the vibrations. You know, there's the um, the famous story with the great violinist musician. Oh, his name eludes me now. Okay. But anyway, this this musician he tried an experiment. He sat down in Washington D.C. There's a major train station there, where thousands of people commute every day and he sat down with his Stradivarius violin and began to play most exquisite music that people pay thousands of dollars to come hear him in a concert and nobody noticed because he was just sitting there like looked like a beggar in the train station until one little child came over and started watching him then people started collaborating and they realized who it was was just to show you, if it was a concert, everybody knows. So it's part of the ego involved. You know, I'm, I'm, I paid money to be at this concert. Here, the rush hour of their lives was so distracting. So you're not going to hear the sensitive chords or sounds of music if you allow the loud noises to drown them out. Same thing like uh, parents and children. Children give off vibes. But parents are so busy with their lives, they sometimes don't hear them. So listening is an art. To listen, you need to shut off the extracurricular sounds of life and pick up those vibrations. That requires humility, it requires a sensitivity. So I think once a person allows themselves to go there, it becomes very easy to appreciate these vibes and access them. I think most of us don't access them because we're just so distracted. And sometimes it's like, you know, you don't stop to smell the roses type of idea. You get so caught up in your own survival and your own responsibilities, you forget there are real vibes going on. I always tell people, you don't have to go anywhere. You have them right here. I love Michelangelo's response when he was asked, how do you carve those beautiful sculpts? He was a sculptor. How do you sculpt and carve those beautiful angels in the marble? So he said, I see the angels trapped in the marble. In the marble, I see the angels trapped in the marble. I carved and carved and set them free. So you have all the music and song and beauty and angels within you, but there's so many outside sounds that drown it out. You don't even realize. So I think vibes is more of an emerging thing. It emerges if you shut off those sounds. Like all that hyperstimulation of our senses doesn't allow the vibes to emerge. And when they do, it's magic. I see it all the time. When people can shut that down, suddenly things happen that you'd never believe. You get the egos out of the way, the agendas, you know, the financial objectives, and things are just pure. That's when the magic happens. With vibrations, is there any link to relationship or uh, connection with other people? Vibrations are definitely connected to relationships. You know, some people say, I date someone, I see someone and I don't feel the vibe, or I do feel the vibe, there is for sure. When we're speaking right now, there's a vibe, even uh, for those that will see this on camera. There's a vibe. It comes through the eyes, through the tone, through the voice, through the sincerity. 
there's an expression, words from the heart enter the heart. I have it in the back of the book, actually. <laughs> words from the heart enter the heart. Words from the brain go into one ear and out the other. Or as I like to say it, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Care gives off a vibe. Knowledge does not. If I share with you data, it may be useful to you, but it's not going to give off a vibe. It won't resonate. If I share how much I care, empathy, that will resonate. You'll feel it. And that is the vibe, the feeling, the emotion within something. So it's all about relating. People who love each other are essentially, their vibrations are uh, communicating with each other. And that's why it's stimulating. You know, people who just talk from their heads, you right away know it's more of a, just a, it's just a mind game. It's more of a brain. It's like a machine. We started with fear. I think let's, let's end with fear. Um, and that's the, the fear of change. Now, I know we covered, we covered some of this, obviously, at the start of this video. But um, yeah, the, the, the fear of change for a lot of people. I think before we were talking about being paralyzed by fear and not doing anything, but there's some, some people who need change in their lives, but they're so scared of what that looks like and they decide to stay in the middle. There was, um, I, can't, I, I can't remember who it was, but um, I, heard, I heard this online recently that there is a, there is a middle of, of bearability that it's like, it's, it's not quite good, it's not quite bad, but it's, it's enough that there was, people will stay there, but people are so fearful of taking the leap to what is good that they remain in this sort of middle ground for their whole yeah. lives. Path of least resistance, yeah. The, the path of least, I mean, let's start with that then, the path, the path of least resistance. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. I'll start with the story with myself when I was a child. I remember I was in the summer bungalow colony, my parents, my family, friends, and I had learned to swim. I was a pretty good swimmer in the swimming pool. I would go swimming every day, but then I wanted to dive. I wanted to learn how to dive. And for some strange reason, I would go up on the diving boards and I was afraid to jump. I just had this, this irrational fear. And, uh, and it wasn't because I was afraid of water. I, I, I swam, I knew how to swim. So I remember I used to think to myself, why am I afraid to dive? Okay, I said, maybe the diving board's too high up. Let me dive from the edge of the pool. So I stood there, also wouldn't dive. And then you start playing all these games with yourself. You know, okay, I'm going to count down from 10 to 1. And I count, then you have some excuse, I'll count again. Okay, I'll do, count from 100 to 1. Count from 1,000 to 1. So a whole summer passed, and I never dived. I was afraid to dive. And it was the strangest thing, because again, I, I was saying to myself, what are you afraid of? What's going to happen? Your stomach will split up? You know, they have this thing. That... Anyway, the next summer, same story. I did the same thing, and... Uh, and then I said, you know what, I'll try a new trick. Instead of just standing on the edge of the pool, I'll sit and I'll just drop myself in. You know, it's not such a big drop. And even that, for some reason, I just had this crazy fear. And finally, a friend of mine snuck up behind me without me knowing, and he just pushed me in when I was trying this thing. And, I, and that was it. I got over my fear. He pushed me in, and I swam and then I went back and I dived and I dived from the edge of the pool and then from the diving board. I got over the fear simply because someone pushed me. But I always as an adult tried to analyze what was this? I stood on the ground, that was not a problem. I have no problem being in the water. What was the concern, the fear? Is my theory, the fear of change, which means standing on the ground, we know how to do. You know how to swim in the water, but that split second, you're not in the water and not on the ground is the fear, a certain unknown, what it was, it's like a suspension. And I realized that we are all concerned the transition of change is fearful because you're not used to it, it's something new. And we always gravitate to that which was comfortable for us, that which is easy, we're secure with it. But on the other hand, all growth comes only when you change. Because if you stay, like they say, if nothing changes, nothing changes. Or I like to put it, if you think what you thought and you say what you said and you do what you did, you know what you're going to have, what you had. It's a mathematical certainty because nothing's changed. Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. But there's a, a fear because there is a change, a change of the climate, a change of environment, of atmosphere. And that was what I, it's my own psychological theory. 
And I think it's critical that people realize that growth is always going to come with some discomfort. And that's where the path of least resistance comes in. I say it always to people. I said, if you're more comfortable in this painful situation, you're going to stay there. It'll only be when it's less comfortable to stay there than to move. Like you see this, God forbid, the Stockholm Syndrome of people who stay in relationships that are abusive. A woman will stay in a marriage where her husband beats her physically. You think this is crazy. But, but it's the known evil and the path of least resistance until that mother or sees her husband being a threat to her children or something else shakes her up. She starts lowering her resistance I said, you know, I can live with this. It's my fault. She'll find excuses. But that's what people do. The path of least resistance is what you will choose, even if it's a terrible choice. So you have to realize that there is that fear, but all growth is going to come from that. I mean, who doesn't have that element? When we go into adolescence, when we leave our home for the first every child cries when you go to school the first day or camp. There's, there's the unknowns, but that's how you become an independent person. So you need the proper balance. I'm not suggesting anyone has to do anything radical, but every metamorphosis is going to require a transition. And the transition, I use an expression from mystical teachings, that there's a state of being. To get to a new state of being, you need to go through a void, a vacuum. You need to shed one layer of skin to assume a new layer of skin. There's no other way. And that's always life. Creativity is always going to be followed by frustration. Because you're, and the big, and the more creative, the more novel is the new energy, the more the discomfort is going to precede it. Disruption has to be seen as a stepping stone towards higher states of growth, toward a paradigm shift. You know, a lot of the things we've spoken about in our previous conversation as well was having awareness to be able to change. And it was a bad situation that created that awareness for change. But like, again, in in these situations, like, um, yeah, could you just speak on the reality of that? And is it something you you see quite a lot? Is the only catalyst for change greater pain or greater challenge? Unfortunately, in many cases, that's the way because that's human nature. If you're comfortable, what's going to motivate you to move? I meet people and I say, you're too comfortable. If you're very comfortable, God bless you. I'm not here to make you uncomfortable. You know, someone once told me they'd like to make me a business card. You make happy people miserable and miserable people happy. You know, if someone's too happy, they're not going to grow. But it's not my job to wake them up, you know. So there's nothing, there's no catalyst that's better than, than a painful situation. I would love to say that a person who's in a painful situation should have an epiphany or something, they suddenly see the light and they say, this is not acceptable. But if someone's been breathing toxic air for years, they get used to it. To the point they'll say, it's not so bad. You know, they're living in darkness. I got used to it. It's not so bad. But healing, what they call awareness, is half the process of healing. If you're not aware of a problem, if you're minimizing it, denial is another one. So, Unfortunately, in many cases, it comes through something where you finally hit rock bottom, as they say. Something really shows you this is not acceptable. But are there exceptions? Of course there are. I've seen people, a moment of grace or someone they met or something they saw and they realized, what am I doing to my life? And that's what we like to do. I mean, when I meet with people, they come speak with me and many people do. I don't try to uh, read them the riot act and tell them how bad this is. I try to wake them up the other way around, showing them there's a better alternative. But unfortunately, sometimes recognizing how bad it is is what wakes people up. But it could come through light. It can come through darkness. We always try to do it through light, through something positive, being exposed to something positive. You know? Um, A lot of people don't even realize what healthy love is. They've been so exposed to unhealthy love, so they expect that. And when you show, they show them, one second, I'll show you another approach to love. And they say, really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that people love each other actually are kind to each other. I thought, oh, you love each other, you always hurt each other. There are people who have told this to me. I remember one sitting right here. And I had someone, a woman was sitting to my right. She was, and she was gone through a very traumatic childhood. And I don't know, I, I reached out my hand to go pick up a napkin or something. And she flinched. 
I said, why are you flinching? She said, I thought you were going to slap me. I said, why would I slap you? Didn't did I, you know? She said, because that's what I'm used to. I used to get slapped by her loved ones, so to speak. So here I'm being kind to her. So the next thing she thought, I'm going to slap her. It was irrational. She didn't, she apologized. But I suddenly realized her reality has been so jaded and so distorted that she thinks that's natural, that, that she's going to be, uh, for no reason, like, you know. And that's that's unfortunate. So hopefully we can wake people up without having to hit rock bottom. But sometimes that's how it happens. I also, again, want to bring some awareness to the book. Um, also, your you know your courses, the website, the Instagram pages, the YouTube channel, all going to be linked down below. If you enjoyed any of that you've heard here, Toward a Meaningful Life is a book that I distill all these teachings. I have another, I have another book called The Spiritual Guide to Counting the Omer and 60 Days. Spiritual Guide to the High Holidays. We have the website, MeaningfulLife.com. We're on Instagram, on YouTube, of course, Meaningful Life Center. And please subscribe and join us. And I have many courses. I have a course called Discover Your Personal Mission. I have a course on the, on the four elements, the spirituality of the four elements, on how to, a, toward a meaningful mood. Got a lot of material. Just check out MeaningfulLife.com. There's plenty of material there. Thank you so much to Rabbi Simon Jacobson for doing this. I know we've used this theme before, the escaping of the matrix, but with today's social media presence, the way in which we interact with everybody, I do think these videos are very, very valid. Thank you so much to Rabbi Simon Jacobson for articulating it in this way. Remember, it is the Black Friday sale at mulliganbrothers.com. Use code BLACK at checkout for buy one, get one free across the whole range at mulliganbrothers.com whilst stocks last. As always guys as well, we're trying to build a community here and I'm asking you guys, please hit the notification bell and join the 10% of viewers who are subscribed to the channel. Yes, that is only 10%. By the end of 2024, I wanna be at 30% of you guys subscribed to the channel. So hit those buttons down below, hit the join button down below. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one. Peace.